Hey guys, Captain Dylan Hubbard here at Hubbard's Marina. Are you ready to win some free trips, learn more about fishing, and have a great time? It's Sunday night, y'all, and it's time for that live stream show. We do this every Sunday night at 7.30 p.m. We're going to give away $1,500 in free trips. We're going to answer your questions live, and we're going to have a good time doing it, showing you what we're catching now, what's coming up, showing you photos, showing you the weather, talking about the weather, and how it affects fish, and plus answering your questions live during the show. If you want to be entered to win free fishing trips, all you have to do is comment one time on the Hubbard's Marina Facebook stream. So go over to Facebook.com, find the Hubbard's Marina page, make sure you like, follow, subscribe, all that good stuff. But find the live video, comment one time, anything you want, let us know where you're watching from, and uh, make sure you like the stream and share it, that helps as well, and you're entered for a chance to win. So all you have to do is comment once. And then watch the show live because we're going to randomly choose one name throughout the show a couple different times to give away a five-hour half day for two guests, a 10-hour all day for two guests, and a Hubbard's Marina swag pack. And then finally, the 39-hour trip for one as well. So make sure you watch live, make sure you comment once, and don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, we're also streaming live to Trovo, Twitch, and also Instagram as well. So make sure you check us out on all the different social medias. Stay tuned. Watch live. Don't forget, if you have a question you want answered live during the show, you do have to text it to the phone number at the bottom of the screen in order for us to see your question. Because those comments, they happen fast. We're streaming to multiple different pages across multiple different platforms. So I don't always see your comment live during the show. So if you want me to answer your comment live during the show, you do have to go ahead and text us your question at the bottom of the screen. With that, want to make sure we give a shout out to our friends over at Gator Gym's Tackle, 3301 Pinellas Point Drive South in St. Pete. Make sure you stop by, tell our friends over at Gator Gym's that we said hello and that we sent you. And if you bring a young angler with you, they get a free gift for that. So make sure you tell them the Hubbard's Marina sent you. Also, want to make sure we give a shout out to all of those in our supporters club who are watching, uh, who help fuel the show, make it possible. We appreciate everybody in our supporters club, supporters group. We do that after show, after every one of these live shows. We have another private after show in our private supporters group. It's only $4.99 a month. You get four private after shows. You get access to our private group. You get more behind the scenes info and upfront communication and some silly stuff that goes on in there. So check it out. Again, the Supporters Club is only $4.99 a month. It's a huge value, and we appreciate all of those of you in that supporters group. Plus, want to give a shout-out to those sending stars, which also helps to fuel the show and make what we do possible. Uh, we have Craig Robinson sharing the stream. Thanks, buddy. Michael Gatewood sharing the stream as well. Sam Lang with a big 490. Appreciate those stars, Sam. Craig Robinson, what's up, buddy? Nick Nieves with a 1,000 stars. Thank you, Nick. Sam Lang, thanks for the share. Eli Coleman, Denoris Hall, appreciate the shares there. Larry White with a big 200. James McCollum with 500. Thanks, buddy. Jeremy Shelton sharing the stream. Thank you, my friend. Sean Gossier with 1250. Appreciate that, Sean. Jer Jeff Reedy sharing the stream. Jody Mallory with the share. Pete Angel, Terry, Keith, all sharing the streams as well. Appreciate all of that. Craig, thanks for the stars. Tim as well. Keith White, uh, Katrina, LaShonda, and uh, Scott, Jennifer, and let's see here. We have Jasmine, John, and, of course, Kyle and Stephen Batchelor, Craig Robinson, and a big 1,200 from D Beers. Appreciate you, D and Mike. Appreciate all of those sending stars and helping us to share the stream. Thanks, Ron Beaton, for that share as well there. All right, Craig Robinson, appreciate you as well. All right, so with that, let's get into a little bit more about tonight's 
talk to you a little bit about what we're catching now. Then we're going to get into the weather. Then we're going to do a quick announcement or two and tell you what's going on and coming up. And then we're going to get into your questions. Remember, if you want a question answered live during the show, make sure you go ahead and text it to the phone number at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, Tammy Robinson. Appreciate the star or the shares there. All right, let's get into what we're seeing out there on the water. Inshore right now, we've seen some of those gag grouper uh, coming around the uh, docks, piers, bridges, jetties, but... We're definitely seeing more and more of those uh, mangrove snapper showing up. Mangrove snapper are definitely showing up in a big way. Those mangrove snapper are starting to push out those sheep's head a little bit. So definitely pretty cool when we're seeing those mangrove snappers show up so heavily already as well. The Jack Crevel, 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 however you want to pronounce it, I call them canal tuna, uh, are pretty heavily present. Uh, Our friend John Sasser catching some big old jacks while targeting those snook in the morning. The Skyway Fishing Pier loaded down with the mackerel. The mackerel are thick inside the bay, outside the bay, on the beaches, on the flats. Mackerel fishing going well. A lot of redfish action right now. The redfish are thick, starting to school up, and really, really prolific around the area. So some good action for the redfish. The soft plastics working well. Live shrimp, white bait, a variety of different things producing those redfish plus of course the sheep's head still biting well still seeing a lot of those sheep's head around the docks piers bridges jetties this one was shot by scraps uh, on the dock with a a hawaiian sling Uh, a lot of those sheep's head around right now snook action really really picking up nicely the snook were so thick this morning that even jose ortiz caught some snook on the dock this morning oh there are were there were more photos all right i was wondering it kind of skipped on me a little bit i thought we were at the end but josh pointed out i wasn't quite at the end there are a lot more snook photos that i thought were coming up uh we are seeing quite a few snook like i mentioned definitely around john's pass the best action on those snook are at the early, early morning time frame prior to sunrise. Once the sun comes up, the snook bite kind of dies off a little bit in John's Pass. You're still able to get them, but it's definitely a little bit more picky, fewer farther between. The trout action still going well as well. Man, I am hitting too many buttons too quickly tonight. Uh, the trout action is going well as well. Uh, we're still seeing quite a few trout. So those wintertime patterns, those sheep's head, those trout, they're sticking around, but we're starting to see the pompano pick up quite a bit. There's still some flounder around. The snook are back. A lot of those summertime patterns settling in with the mackerel, that kind of thing as well. So it's kind of that transitional period. We're starting to get more of the wintertime patterns receding, though, more of the wintertime, I mean, excuse me, summertime, warmer weather patterns settling in and seemingly sticking around. We're going to move our way near shore and show you guys what we're catching near shore. Hogfish action still going well, but has definitely slowed down. We're still seeing a few hogfish. I don't know what's going on. It's like it's double tapping when I hit a button. It's weird. I'm going to the mouse. Uh, So hogfish are still around, but definitely have slowed down a little bit. Kingfish action going well. We're seeing a lot of these kingfish showing up already. These kingfish were actually caught north of our area a little bit. Uh, So we're seeing kingfish already that have pushed all the way past us, which is good to see kingfish inundated throughout the range of our area. Plus, these mackerel are really prolific around the area. We're seeing mackerel around the jetties, along our pass, and even along the beaches to near shore. The shark action is picking up, seeing a lot of sharks around and seemingly more and more. A lot of the trigger fish being caught right now. And the big news tonight Nearshore, really the big news this past week was the red grouper action. Even nearshore, like this is not that deep of water, we're seeing these big red grouper. Uh, Even inside 100 foot, we're finding some fat red grouper. And out deeper, even bigger red grouper, like these toads in these photos here from the Flying Hub 2. But the hub fishing pretty close 
uh, near shore, finding some solid red grouper. And even the 10-hour trip, finding some solid red grouper too. So it's cool to see the red grouper bite pick up so heavily as we see the uh, hogfish start to slow down a little bit. We're fishing a little deeper right now and really starting to dial into these red grouper. So pretty positive news uh, to see such a uptick in our red grouper as we kind of see a downturn in the hogfish bite a little bit. The red grouper are really filling in the holes. Plus, we're seeing more lane snapper action near shore and seeing some nice mangrove snapper action as well. So some really good opportunities near shore for fat red grouper, nice lane snapper, mangrove snapper, plus the uh, lane snapper, mangroves, and a few of the hogfish, and then the mackerel and kingfish as well. So don't forget the flat lines because definitely that time of year where we're seeing the mackerel around, a handful of the kingfish, and even some sailfish Three local charter captains have caught and released sailfish this past week. Cobia are around too, so you have a chance for those cobia. So you never know what you might catch while flatline fishing this time of year. So definitely make sure you're trolling uh, on the way out, way back if you can. If you're on a trip that can troll, or if you're in your own boat, make sure you have a trolling rod ready. And then definitely want to be ready with that flatline as well. Derek Gossier, appreciate the share, and Christine as well. Stephen Woods, appreciate those 200 stars, my friend, as well. African Pompano, didn't get any of those this past week. We weren't out there on one of those 39-hour trips, unfortunately. I would have bet that the 39-hour trip that was supposed to come back today probably would have caught some African Pompano, but unfortunately, we weren't able to get out there this past weekend. It got really, really rough Friday and into Saturday. It was 10, 11-foot seas out there, so because of that, we had to cancel the 39-hour trip that was supposed to go out over the weekend and come back this morning, so we didn't get any of the African Pompano, but we should be able to get out there uh, Tuesday on a 39-hour trip. It's looking a little bumpy, but let's get into the weather now. So, weather-wise, it is blustery a little bit this week. We're going to hit hubbardsmarina.com, click fishing trips, and then scroll down to the weather links page. We'll start in the 5 and 10 hour forecast area, the Egmont Key entrance forecast. One thing I want to point out, looking real nice this upcoming weekend, Friday and into the weekend, looking real good. But from now until then, we're dealing with a little bit of wind. You can see today, not so great. Definitely windy and bumpy. However, that wind is shifting out of the east, which is nice. And a nice wind shift out of the east, you know what that gives us? We're going to switch to a super forecast and show you the hour by hour. Look at tomorrow afternoon. Really, tomorrow mid-morning, going to start laying down. And tomorrow afternoon, looking gorgeous. It is going to be a little breezy and bumpy in the morning with three and a half foot seas. Almost 30 mile an hour gusts. But because it's out of the east, we can fish on the beach Troll out there with the mackerel and the kingfish. Get some mackerel and kingfish trolling out. Fish closer, shallower. We've been doing well in that range. Even as shallow as 20, 25, 30 foot, we're catching a lot of the gray snapper, white grunts. You got a shot for the hogfish. So we're going to be fishing hard tomorrow morning on double half days. And then tomorrow afternoon, we've got double half days as well. So tons of room tomorrow to go half day fishing. And tomorrow afternoon is probably your best weather opportunity because after tomorrow afternoon, it goes back to these really high breezes. Tuesday's not looking so great because that wind starts to shift out of the south. East wind, we can fish on the beach, not go so deep and get away with it, even if it's blowing pretty hard. But Tuesday, it starts to shift out of the south, and it's going to be over four foot for a majority of the day. So Tuesday's not looking super fishable right now not looking too doable for the near shore half day stuff but it does calm down tuesday afternoon wednesday is looking doable just bumpy it is out of the south but the wind calms down enough to where we should be able to get out there wednesday it's just going to be a bumpy one for those half day guests thursday cold front rolls through so it picks back up thursday really not looking so great thursday either Friday, it starts to calm down, but wind is still out of the north. 
looking nice again Saturday. So really your best opportunity to fish Monday afternoon or waiting until the upcoming weekend or sneaking out there in the midweek time frame for that 39-hour adventure. We're going to pop over to the 39-hour forecast and show you the Tuesday 39-hour trip. It calms down a little bit once we leave the dock, so it's going to be six foot when we leave the dock, and it's going to take us a little while to get out there. Over the first night, it's going to be a solid six foot. Then it's going to be a little rainy on the afternoon of Wednesday, but fishable conditions, less than six foot, but it's looking like a bumpy ride, bumpy wet ride home, and uh, it's definitely going to be a bumpy trip, a solid four to six foot, but it looks doable. We'll be able to pull it off. Uh, it's just going to be bumpy, rough, nasty conditions, but fishable. Friday night's night snapper looking good, though. Definitely good for the night snapper coming up Friday and uh, the weekend looking spectacular as well. So, again, tomorrow afternoon's half-day trip, the Tuesday 39-hour trip if you're adventurous, the Friday 12-hour night snapper, really good option as well. So that's what I'd be looking at, kingfish, mackerel on the beach, fishing shallower tomorrow afternoon uh, would be your goal, your window, and then waiting till the weekend when it starts to calm down a little bit. Or if you're an advanced angler and you want to weather the storm, the 39-hour trip looks doable as well. All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about the weather. We showed you what we're catching now. want to make sure we do our first free giveaway of the night. We got a five-hour half day for two to give away, a 39-hour trip for one, a 10-hour all day for two, and that Hubbard's Marina swag pack. But let's go ahead and give away our... Hubbard's Marina Swag Pack first. Let's find out who won the Swag Pack for one lucky winner. Winner is... Bobby Rossi. Congratulations, Bobby. You have won the Hubbard's Marina Swag Pack. You have to text us your full home address within five minutes to claim your free trip. And you also have to send us your t-shirt size so we can send you the right size t-shirt. Jeff Reedy, appreciate those 1,200 stars, my friend. George Arterburn, appreciate those 490 stars. Richard Harcourt, thanks for the 200 there, buddy. Tom Collins, Ed Landry, and Christine, appreciate those shares. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, looks like we've got Cap Mike on the line. Perfect timing, Captain Mike. It, it's like he's gotten better with age, better with practice. What's up, Mike? What up, dog? You called that the perfect time. It was like we planned that. We did, actually. Yeah. Kind I'm gonna of. I'm gonna run with that. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, how are things inshore? It uh, it was a beautiful week of weather this past week. Not so great this coming week, but at least we got some <laughs> yeah. good weather in there. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's the bite's good. Um, it's really good. I'm I'm anxious to see. I'm gonna try to fish in the morning, uh, even though it doesn't look too awesome out yeah. uh, we're gonna try Not and get crazy. it in i got a yeah i got a corporate group that just wants to try to get on the water and i said we're trying to pull it off so try to find some places to mm. get in on that wind uh, i know we got a small craft advisory right now yeah uh, but you know there's i mean the the redfish population is really good there's still a lot of big trout around uh we're catching some snook i mean you know, uh, hopefully this wind will let up so we can get out there and do some king fishing, some of that macro fishing off the beach. Um, but, I, I mean, you know, right now you just can't complain. There's a lot of bait around already. The bite's pretty decent, so it's uh, it's a good time. I, I think, personally, I know everybody's kind of itching. Yeah. It happens every time, you know, this time of year. Everybody just wants to be this thing to completely just go bonkers. But, to me, I like some of these colder you know, weekends to kind of just slow everything down a little bit so that it doesn't, you know, spring doesn't come and boom, it's over and it's summertime. Yeah. So I, I kind of like the, you know, this morning it 
coming out of the radio station. It was a little chilly out with that breeze. So, yeah, a little morning. bit. It's going to be a little chilly tomorrow, too. So, it's going to be like 68 degrees, which, again, I, I just think that's good. I think it, it keeps some of those fish in the rivers, slows things down a little bit. We don't get too carried away too early here. But uh, all in all, things are, are, are looking up. Like Hugh said, you know, weather's going to be tough this week. There's no doubt about that. We're going to have to work around that some. But, you know, before you know it, it'll be – you know, 105 degrees. Yeah, it'll be 105 degrees, and we'll have no breeze. Yeah. So enjoy you know, it coming. while we can, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, it should be a good week. It should be. Like I said, we're gonna have to grind for it a little bit. But uh, like I said, if if you if you spend some time, you know, in your waters, whatever wherever that may be, there's there's bound to be some areas where you can kind of get out of it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that's just what you got to do. We're on the full moon, which is not my favorite, but you're going to have moving water. Even, you know, the big east wind tomorrow, we should still have some moving water. Might come in a little slower than we'd like, but it is what it is. And, you know, you just got to go fishing and grind your way through it. Yeah. Work work hard at it. It's definitely going to be yeah. a challenge. This week is working hard around that weather and finding those little weather windows, those little shorelines that are wind protected and uh, yep. hopefully finding some feed and fish that are ready to rock and roll. And if you can, that's really the key. You kind of hit on it right there is finding that wind protected shoreline mm-hmm. um, that the sun can heat it up a little bit. If you get the right color bottom in on those shorelines, some mm-hmm. seawalls, let that water come up just a couple of degrees in those areas. Um, look for the mullet. I've, I've been a little bit encouraged. Um, and it's, it's really the mullet scene, in my opinion, is horrible. But like I said, I was a little encouraged because I found a couple of areas where there was quite a few mullet here over the last, you know, a week or so. Um, and that's kind of a positive. And I found them kind of bebopping, hiding from the wind here and there, you know, on some windy days, just trying to get into some, some back bays and stuff. And, and we found some mullet. And wherever we found the mullet, we found fish. Yeah. So, you know, keep your eyes open for those, those you know, schools of mullet. I usually like to see really big mullet. I call them meat chickens. Um, I, I didn't see those, but we saw a decent sized mullet. Um, and again, every everywhere we found, you know, really big schools where you're like, God, that's a lot of mullet. There was fish on those shorelines as well. So just something to uh, be on the lookout for. So to summarize, you were bebopping around looking for meat chickens. <laughs> Hundred percent. Well, right. well done. I hope just, you're taking notes. Just Atta making boy. sure we were kept, we were summarizing <laughs> for those who were watching. <laughs> you know, you know, I don't speak English too well. That's all good. Awesome. <laughs> I spent you know Sundays. Sundays should be kind of a get out of jail free day for me because I spent the morning with my own. Yes. So yeah, you know well, my man. lingo's all jacked up. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for that, sure. Bad influence in the morning. Hundred <laughs> percent. Well, that's good news, and and I know that. There's some tarping around already. There's some permit yeah. action going on. So it's yep. uh, Pompano yep. are getting frisky. It seems like everything's coming together. And uh, it's an exciting it time of year. Just got to get those w- little weather windows, right? Yeah, it's 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 really, you know, if I'm being honest, it's probably my favorite time of year, especially when we actually have a winter. Yeah. Um, March can be a little frustrating because March is usually a pretty breezy month. So, again, you're starting to get that. You know, we're okay, cool. It's we're gone, we're gone. It's off. We're launching, and then you get a week like this where you're like, uh, oh, okay, it's like, you can only do so much. It's like uh, that red light, green light game when you were a kid. Yeah. That's what March yeah. is. It's like you're oh, right. green light. Everybody's sprinting, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, someone yells red light, and you just like get slammed <laughs> into a wall with wind. Uh huh. Yeah. Hurt. Yeah. Step yeah. on the brakes. Here we go. We're chilling again. But yeah. uh, it's like fake it's, spring. It's, uh, yeah, it really is. And March is is notoriously this way yeah it's one of those months where the end of february you start to get a little bit of warm up a couple of fish start to show up here and there you start to think it's going to bust loose and then march normally just kind of like slow your roll boys that's okay it'll make for yeah it'll make for a a sexy april so that's what we're uh we just need to eyeball that and we're, we'll be good to go. Get through eyeballing, this week and we'll be good to go. Eyeball on the sexy April. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> be bopping our way through it, buddy. <laughs> One way to do it. Stay focused on the positive. I appreciate it. it. And uh, 
And I really enjoyed this morning's radio show. Uh, it's classic Sunday morning radio where we're threatening biological warfare to local politicians. It was beautiful. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no <laughs> idea. What literally brought about. up mailing disease <laughs> to politicians. <laughs> Did I was I, like, did he really I, just say that? Yeah. I might have. Yeah. You never know. I, 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 there's no recordings of it anywhere. There's no proof. Yeah, Anything it's, on Facebook, it's live on believe. Facebook. It is definitely you can't, you can't. You can't believe Facebook. That that could be misplayed. Yes. You know, they, to they, they took it out of context, obviously. It's not admissible in court. So. <laughs> Entertainment purposes only. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know what the good news is, is we'll be shooting straight on Tuesday night. Yep. I'm with the uh, the Hall of Famer, our good friend Captain Lisa Fitzgerald at Bartow Ford. So, six to eight p.m. out there at Bartow Ford. Anybody that wants to join us, Silver Ring. Oh yeah. We got Ingle coolers, bull bay rods, all that good stuff. So, uh, please come out and join us. It's always a good show. Lisa does a good job. Obviously, you know she's she's really good at talking the conservation game, um, but she's also really really good at talking fishing. She's yep. won kingfish tournaments, tarpon tournaments, redfish tournaments. I mean, she's done just about everything there is to do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Amen. So, um, yeah, so just, you know, come on out, bring your questions. Uh, she's super personable and uh, and does a really good job at the seminar. Last time I had her there, I was, I was really impressed. I mean, she brought lures and rods and different things to show different applications and her favorite baits and all kinds of stuff. So it was it was pretty informative. Awesome, man. Well, Tuesday night, yeah, 6 to 8 p.m., Bartow Ford. That's going to be a good yes, time. Appreciate it. It'll be a good one. You're the man, brother. I appreciate the time. All right, man. You have a good night. Tell Beth All I right, said partner, hello. All right, partner, you too. We'll do it. Talk soon. See, See you, big dog. Bye, buddy. Bye. Always a pleasure to hear from Mike. Never know what, what's going to happen <laughs> or what he's going to say. Be bopping around looking for meat chickens focused on sexy April. That, that was uh, – <laughs> to summarize uh inshore highlights if you will uh so we always talk a little bit about what's going on now we show you photos we talk about the weather we do some announcements and then we get into your questions so your questions are coming up now before we do the questions though I want to remind everybody not only is the bartow ford event this week tuesday 6 to 8 p.m but friday you know what friday is guys it's final friday y'all Final Friday is in full swing this Friday from 6 to 9 p.m. And you know what's really cool? Some some exciting news about Final Friday. I don't know if Josh even knows this yet. Maybe, maybe he does. Chick-fil-A is going to be there, guys. Chick-fil-A. So not only are we going to have free beer, free soda, free water, free crawfish boil, and then we have a bunch of vendors, we have a DJ, we have live music, a John's Pass Wide pub crawl, but Chick-fil-A is coming to set up a booth in front of Hubbard's Marina. I feel like I've made it in life because Chick-fil-A called me and said, hey, can we come set up a booth at Hubbard's Marina? And I was like, really? <laughs> so exciting. So chicken sandwiches. So not only are you going to get free beer and crawfish, but now you can get your chicken sandwich on too. So going to be super awesome that we're going to have Chick-fil-A there as well. So Definitely exciting. Hopefully, we'll see you this Friday night from 6 to 9 p.m. for Final Friday. Uh, it's going to be a special one for sure. And the weather is looking good this weekend too, so good opportunity to come out and join us for sure. Uh, besides Final Friday, we talked about the kingfish and mackerel. That was one big announcement I wanted to talk a lot about. The pompano, the red grouper, the snook, everything is really, really going well right now. So hopefully... You get a chance to join us on the water again tomorrow afternoon or this weekend coming up looks best all right let's get into the questions el questions if you have questions you got to text us your question at the phone number at the bottom of the screen all right first question of the night uh are the hogfish still biting and if so what depth so all cooler months long, generally like October-ish through around April-ish, we get those hogfish. And the hogfish action goes best for us right around that anywhere from like 30 to about 60 foot of water. We target those hogfish. Then 
as it starts to warm up and the water starts to warm up, those hogfish, they spread out a little bit. They get a little bit harder to target via hook and line. And uh, we start to see a decrease in the number of hogfish that we catch. And then we start to target the red grouper more. And really the last two to five years, the red grouper fishing hasn't been all that great once we start stop targeting those hogfish. Uh, but we've been catching a lot of lanes and red uh, mangrove snapper and kind of filling in the holes. This year, it seems like the hogfish are starting to slow down. We're starting to catch those red grouper more. And then we're also still seeing good numbers of lanes and a few mangroves. And right now, we've got the, the mackerel and the kingfish too. So it's exciting. Red grouper, though, we're fishing a little deeper. So hogfish action right around 30 to 60 foot of water. Now we're moving a little deeper, targeting those red grouper right around 60 to about up to 100 foot of water. So we're fishing deeper, still getting a chance for those hogfish, but definitely seeing more of those red grouper. Behind these fronts, we'll stay a little shallower and target the hogfish because a lot of times the fronts will concentrate the hogfish. So you still have a good shot at catching hogfish all the way through into May. Once May rolls around, end of May, water starts to really warm up and into June, that's really when hog fishing is pretty much done until around October. We catch hogfish June, July, August, September, and into October, but we just don't get really good numbers of them. Cooler months, we'll catch 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 hogfish a trip. And then in these warmer months, we'll catch 5, 10, 15 hogfish a trip. Uh, and then once it gets really hot, five or less, and we're fishing deeper most of the time. So that's kind of how it works, hogfish, red grouper, depth-wise. Uh, it's Next question, it seems like kingfish and cobia action in our area has been weak the last few years. What do you think that could be attributed to? Uh, there's been a variety of conversations. I would agree 100% with that sentiment that cobia and kingfish action has been soft. Really, the last, I would say, almost 10 years, it seems like that has been on a decline, for cobia at least. Uh, for kingfish, it's probably a little shorter than that, that it's been on a decline maybe the last five years. Um, I think cobia has something to do with the BP oil spill um, because there was just such a downturn in a lot of different things, pelagic-wise, uh, um, amberjack, cobia, kingfish, a lot of those pelagic species, we saw kind of a big downturn post-BP um, oil spill. Also, the fact that we haven't had uh, a big sargasm push. Uh, when I was growing up at a young age, when you went out there in deeper water past 100 foot, there was often we'd run into these huge weed lines of sargasm grass. And a lot of those pelagic species, they recruit their age zero, age one uh, juvenile, sub-juvenile, uh, like little microorganism-sized baby fish, the baby cobia, the baby amberjack, they live in that sargasm weed and they grow up until they're old enough to recruit to the bottom habitat. So they grow up on the surface in that sargasm weed. If there's no sargasm weed, they're babies, they have nowhere to hide. And then all of a sudden, they're going to, that phytoplankton-sized baby fish doesn't have anywhere to grow up, and it's going to get more easily predated. And thus, we're going to have huge missing year classes of those species. So I think it could have something to do with the BP oil spill. It could have something to do with the, um, the lack of sargasm grass in the Gulf of Mexico overall in the last decade. Uh, it could have something to do with the temperature of the Gulf being uh, cyclically changing as well. Um, whether you think it's climate change, whether you think it's cyclical, whether you think whatever it is, sea surface temperatures are higher, which can affect phytoplankton as well. Uh, and then on top of that, you have current changes uh, that these little eddies uh, over three to seven year trends, these currents can kind of change directions and that can really affect distribution of sub juvenile fish as well. So there's a lot of different things that have been pointed to and discussed and researched and they're trying to figure it out for sure. But cobia definitely is a problem. Uh, kingfish have been a little bit soft as well. So interesting conversations that are going on for sure all right let's see what next question do we have 
Are they catching any tuna? Uh, we, we haven't seen a big push in the tuna this year. Normally, blackfin tuna really spike around February, especially the new moon, full moon in February. We see a big spike in blackfin tuna, and then we start catching, <gasps> catching a bunch of them all the way through March and into April. We haven't seen that big spike of tuna, but it's expected. I'm expecting that big spike in blackfin tuna anytime. Also, yeah, uh, I forgot to mention the cobia, the kingfish thing. A big obvious uh, thing that we didn't discuss was algal, algal blooms, uh, water quality issues. Off of Texas, they have brown tide and even red tide. Off our coast, we obviously have the red tide and water quality issues. In the northern Gulf, they have what's called the hypoxic zone. So every single zone of the Gulf, whether you're off of the western Gulf off of Texas, you're in the eastern Gulf off the west coast of Florida, or if you're in the northern Gulf off the Mississippi River Delta, there's bad water and bad water quality issues all the way around the Gulf, which affects feeding fish, the lowest possible rung of the ladder, the food web, uh, those, those um, what do they call them? Um, there's a special scientific name, but I forget what, what it is off the top of my head, but all the bait fish. Uh, we've seen a huge decrease in bait fish. When I was younger, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, even 15 years old, when we left in the morning at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and you headed out into the Gulf, you would see lights in the Gulf of shrimp boats, of anchovy boats, of sardine boats, of seine boats working thread fins. And you used to have all these big commercial boats out there that would target shrimp, that would target thread fin, that would target cigar minnows, that would target scaled sardines, that would target uh, live sardines. You don't see those. You don't see those big schools of bait. You don't see shrimp boats anymore, commercial big shrimp boats off our coast. These fisheries have died in the Gulf of Mexico. And there's not a commercial fishery for them because there's not enough of them to be caught to sustain a business. That's a problem. So we've seen a huge decrease in the number of offshore shrimp boats because they don't have shrimp to catch offshore. And then we've seen a huge decrease in the number of threadfin seine boats and sardines and all these other fish. So definitely uh, been a problem for sure. Plus all the water quality as well. So that goes into all the other things that I mentioned earlier. So tuna, as I was mentioning, we haven't seen that big push of tuna, but we're expecting it. So we should see a lot of tuna coming on one of these 39-hour uh, trips. Donald VC, yes, the Tampa shrimp docks are still around. Yes, there's still shrimp boats in operation. But like I said, when I was younger, 8, 9, 10, 12 years old, we had to run our radar and dodge shrimp boats. You would pass two or three or four shrimp boats every morning and it was easy to before sunrise stop at one of those shrimp boats catch two or three cobia a tuna or two and a kingfish and then get bored and then go bottom fishing we don't see that anymore <laughs> that isn't an option around here anymore just because there's no shrimp boats to run into a lot of those shrimp boats now they go on uh like people are always amazed by this uh a commercial fishing boat that goes and targets grouper and snapper. If it's a rod and reel boat, generally it's a one, two, three day trip. If it's a bandit boat, they might make a seven, eight, 10, 12 day trip. If it's a long line boat, they might make a 14 day trip for grouper, snapper, reef fish. Those shrimp boats, guess how long the normal shrimp boat trip is? The average shrimp boat trip, 21 days. Some of those boats are gone at sea for 40 to 60 days. They'll start fishing out of Tampa. They'll fish all the way to like Port Canaveral and they'll fish all the way back. Or they'll fish all the way to like Texas, Port Aransas and come all the way back. Those shrimp boats cover a ton of water. And uh, they really, really have to work hard to make a uh, financially feasible trip. It's crazy. Crazy. Uh, all right, what is expected for uh, red snapper season this year? I would bet, mm, I would bet five thousand dollars. Red snapper season will open June first and end August twenty fourth at twelve oh one a.m. Very confident in that. 
uh, almost exactly what it was last year. And the reason why I know that is because last year we're managed to our ACT for federally for hire recreational fishermen. So when you're on a charter boat or party boat with someone like Hubbard's Marina, who has a federal permit, we're managed by the federal uh, Gulf Council, NOAA Fisheries. Uh, our season is set based on our quota. And we're managed to our ACT or allowable catch target. Well, this last year, we hit 97% of our ACT. So they were almost 100% correct. They were within 3% of their goal when they set our season. So I would bet with very, very high um, confidence that our season is going to be the exact same it was last year, within 3%. <laughs> so I'm 97% sure that our season will be the exact same as it was last year, which off the top of my head, I want to say, was June 1st through August 24th at 12.01 a.m. So red snapper season will be the almost exact same as it was last year. Uh, what is the best way to stay cool on your boats when it gets blazing hot out there? Book a 39-hour or 44-hour and uh, every now and again go inside. <laughs> the air-conditioned cabin is a real nice uh, come uh, June and July and August. Uh, flying Hub 2, a little bit more challenging out there on the Flying Hub 2. Drink a lot of water and stay hydrated. Drink a lot of food. you got to prepare yourself. Every season, every summer, every red snapper season, we see at least a half a dozen trips ruined because of one person who either didn't take their medication or... Uh, didn't eat or didn't drink water or were very unhealthy and should have never been offshore before. Every year, at least a half dozen trips ruined because of that. If you make sure you're healthy, if you just had heart surgery, don't go offshore. If you just had triple bypass, don't go offshore. If you're recovering from surgery from last week, don't go offshore. All three of those happened last year. Literally, a guy got on the boat, had triple bypass two weeks prior to his 39-hour trip and was like, I'm going fishing. Come on, man. <laughs> so make sure you're healthy. Then make sure you are getting the proper sleep, rest, and food nutrition prior to a trip. One time, a guy fell out, and he said, I was so excited. I haven't slept in two nights, and I didn't eat anything. So he went offshore and passed out and had serious medical implications because he didn't sleep, he didn't eat, and he wasn't hydrated. So if you are eating food, sleeping at night, and drinking water, you should be fine. And uh, it might be a little bit hot. You might get a little bit sunburned, but you'll survive. But if you don't eat, you don't sleep, you don't drink water, you're going to be in a pickle, and something serious can happen. You can get heat. Uh, uh, what's that? Heat stroke is super serious. Uh, what's there's there's two of them. It's been a while. It's been, <laughs> it's been six months since we've dealt with this, but definitely not a good situation when you're offshore and you start to feel overheated. So, drink lots of water. Drink cold water, and I like one of those little towels that you can stick in the cooler. It's like a microfiber towel, but it's not microfiber. It's like rubbery. Uh, they absorb water. You can throw them in a cooler for a minute or roll it around in ice and then put it on your neck, and it will lower your body temperature, real your core body temperature, real, real quickly. Those are really nice. Uh, making sure that you have uh, sun protective clothing, a nice hat, and uh, making sure you're drinking lots of water. That's the goal. Uh, I'm hearing a rumor that gag grouper will only be two gags per vessel. Uh, you're talking to someone in the Atlantic, the South Atlantic. Uh, they did pass a law that said it was going to be two gag grouper per boat. Then they stopped uh, that law from being transmitted. And then they're talking about potentially moving it forward. So that is a South Atlantic thing. The Gulf has a really crappy gag grouper season. Uh, we sh we're expecting gag grouper season to start September 1st, and we probably will see maybe two, three, four, maybe five weeks of gag grouper season. It's going to be short. It's going to suck, but it will stay the same size limit, same bag limit, and all that good stuff. They were talking about going from two fish to one fish. They were talking about changing the bag limit or size limit. They were talking about vessel limits. 
And uh, we poo-pooed all of that um, because if you went from two fish to one fish, uh, you didn't see a significant increase in season. Uh, because a 50% reduction in bag limit does not mean a 50% longer season. A 50% reduction in bag limit going from two fish per person to one fish per person got us like 14% more season, which is negligible for a huge cut in bag limit. So that didn't get support. Uh, changing the vessel limit doesn't really help very much either because the average trip doesn't bring home a... Uh, limit of gag grouper so you don't see a neg negligible change in the fishery so long story short in the gulf you won't see management changes for gag grouper as far as size limit bag limit anything like that they are currently only managing via a season and the reason why is we fought really hard against that because i am confident that we are going to see a change in the gag grouper fishery when we do our next stock assessment because I have confidence that that gag grouper fishery is healthier and it is recovering and we will see that hopefully in the science. And once the science starts to reflect that, we're going to get a longer season. So I don't want to give up 50% of my bag limit now for a 12% increase in this crappy season we currently have uh, to only... A year from now, two years from now, three years from now, be told, all right, now you're back to a year-long season, but we're still only allowed one fish because we gave up 50% of our bag limit, right? I don't want to cut down the bag limit uh, in hopes because I'm confident we're going to see an increase, and that's what I'm waiting for and counting on and hedging my bets against. All right. Let's go ahead and give away our next free trip. We did our swag pack. Let's go ahead and do the 10-hour all-day trip. 10-hour all-day trip for two lucky people. One winner, two guests. Let's see who won the 10-hour all-day for two people. Ted Sunderman from South Dakota. South Dakota. Congratulations, Ted. You've got five minutes or less to claim that free trip by texting us your full home address to the phone number at the bottom of the screen. Congratulations. We've got the five-hour half day for two and the 39-hour trip for one to give away as well. So still some more giveaways going on, so make sure you stay tuned. How was the 12-hour night snapper trip last Friday? Didn't make it out. It was 10-foot seas, 11-foot seas. Uh, so no, no bueno, didn't get the 12 hour night snapper out, but we should get this Friday's out. Weather's looking really, really good. Uh, let's see here. I just saw a piece on recreational fishermen tagging game fish to get population information for NOAA or the state. What can you tell us about the program? Uh, without knowing what kind of game fish you're referring to, it's hard to say, um, uh, because they tag almost every game fish there is, right? So they tag grouper, they tag snapper, they tag redfish, they tag snook, they tag marlin, they tag sailfish, they tag sharks. They tag everything. It's really, really interesting. Josh, uh, Google uh, the ITAG program, I-T-A-G program, Gulf of Mexico, F-W-R-I. See if that comes up. Because there's, um, there's this thing uh, that I found... Oh, cool. Does it show a map? No. Lame. Uh, so, the, oh, there's a map. Nice. So cool. All right, we're going to show you. Oh, that's a really lame map. <laughs> the anticipation. Uh, definitely. Oh, there it goes. It was populating. So, um, basically, what the iTag system does is uh, I learned about this at a... Uh, uh, at a marine recreational education program course, all of these little green things are tag arrays, uh, acoustic sounder arrays. And uh, so it shows little one little uh, uh, green thing here, but that really represents an array. And an array is a bunch of acoustic sounders on the bottom that can pick up the pings 
uh, from these little acoustic tags that are put in fish. And you can see all the little green dots around Florida's coast. Can't really see it too well on the stream probably, but there is a majority of these green dots are all over Florida, whereas the rest of the Gulf and in South Atlantic, there's not as many. Um, and Florida does a really bad to the bone job of putting out all these acoustic arrays. And basically what happens is they tag all these fish. So like I just gave you a huge list of all these fish. Um, I mean, there's just a litany of different fish, species, sharks, rays that get tagged, manta rays, a bunch of crap, whales. And uh, they're sticking these acoustic tags on all these animals <laughs> to do these studies. But a lot of these studies are really hyper-focused on a certain geographic area. So let's say... They're doing a study on sub-adult snook in Tampa Bay. They catch a couple snook. They stick a few acoustic receivers in them. They let them go into this array. Well, fish have tails, right? What do the fish do? They swim through the array, and then they leave. They might come back and get tagged in the array again, but that scientist gets a very limited sample of fish in a very limited geographic range of acoustic receivers and it's not likely they're going to get a lot of information or data. So what a bunch of smart people did was, let's share some information and create this iTag network. And basically what it does is it creates a huge database uh, where scientists can say, these are all the acoustic tags that swam through my array. So a scientist in Alabama might tag a red snapper that might end up in Miami or off the coast of uh, off the coast of the Keys, and that fish's acoustic sounder might swim through an array, and thus the scientists all start sharing information. So it's a really cool way that scientists can uh, communicate, and these tags can relay information. So definitely check out that I tag uh, thing we googled I tag. Gulf of Mexico, uh, FWRI. Uh, Josh is going to drop the link in the chat as well. It's really interesting. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to go through something like the Marine Recreational Education Program or, or visit FWRI, um, it's really interesting to see that lab. It's on the second floor, and uh, it's a huge lab. And they have all these little acoustic receivers in there, and they show you how they catch a fish. They flip it over while it's alive, and they Im surgically implant these acoustic receivers in the fish. And they have a bunch of stories. Like, for example, they tagged this snook in the, uh, I think it was down in Charlotte Harbor, and that snook swam all the way through Okeechobee and out the other side pretty dope <laughs> the snook swam across florida uh so the they have all this information about how the snook travel through the rivers and into the estuaries and they have a ton of science so it's really cool to see and the only way that's possible is because they share information through these acoustic arrays if they didn't share information they would have never known that snook swam all the way through the locks and through okeechobee because they wouldn't have that data so it's pretty wild uh how it all works so cool stuff uh, let's go ahead. Uh, want to make sure we give a shout out to some star senders. We had Jennifer Neal, Craig Robinson, Richard Harcourt sending some more stars. Charles Carter, what's up, buddy? Frank Pender with 300. Thank you, buddy. Angie Darling, Jason Richmond, Stephen Bachelor, Alex Diaz sharing the stream. D Beers with another 500 stars. Michelle John sharing the stream. Jill Petrello sending some stars. Jordan Guru sharing the stream. Appreciate y'all. Uh, George Arterburn with the big stars. Richard Harcourt as well. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, can you keep a tagged fish? <coughs> yes. <clears throat> a lot of those fish, uh, if you catch a snook, uh, a trout, uh, a grouper, and you're cutting it, you're flaying it, and all of a sudden a little black thing pops out that's, that has an FWC sticker and a phone number, uh, that's like a $700 acoustic satellite tag. 
You can call the number. They're not going to get angry at you. If it's a legal size fish, even if it's an illegal size fish, you're calling scientists. You're not calling uh, the, the popo, right? Uh, so the scientists just want their $700 device back. So you can, even if it's an illegal fish, you want to return that device uh, if at all possible. So yes, you can kill a tagged fish. If it's legal and in season, you can kill it. And uh, just relay the information, where you caught it, how big the fish was. Call the phone number, and they'll, they'll ask you some questions. Uh, there's always a phone number on the tag, uh, whether it's an acoustic device that's inserted inside the animal or if it's a dart tag, which is sticking out the back of the animal. Or uh, a lot of times they'll have, like, little radio tags. So there's a lot of different types of tags, depending on the size and what the study is trying to figure out. All right, let's see. What other questions do we have? Uh, is there any squid fishing trips around your area? Interesting. No. Uh, you can catch squid from the Skyway. So I, well, we don't have any squid fishing trips. Uh, but that's pretty cool. That's an interesting idea. Uh, I have done that uh, on our uh, shark trips. We see a lot of squid come up. 12-hour night snappers, we see a lot of squid come up from time to time. 39-hour trips, you might see some squid. So keeping a squid jig is a good idea because catching one of those live squid is amazing. Amazing eating. It's good eating and even better bait, sending one, one of those down. It's kind of like using a live lobster for bait, right? A lobster is a really good bait for Kubera snapper, but if I caught a lobster, it'd be really hard to use that for bait. Same thing with those fresh live squid. Super good eating, but also if you're willing to hook it back up and drop it down, really good eating or really good bait. Um, but you can get what's called a squid jig, and if you see squid up on the surface, you cast those squid jigs to them, and uh, you can actually catch the squid pretty easily. What would be the best way to book a 12-hour extreme trip and guarantee it doesn't get canceled? Um, invent a machine that controls the weather uh there's really no way to do that right uh we are offshore fishing even half day trips get canceled due to weather uh also trips need a certain number of people also they are boats that break down uh, but we work really hard to avoid uh, breakdowns mechanical failures uh, we rarely have a situation where we don't get enough people because even if it's kind of borderline, we send the trip because we try to make everybody as happy as possible. So it's rare that we have to cancel a trip uh, outside of the weather. But we don't control the weather. We guarantee an excellent client experience with superior guest service, but we can't control the weather and we can't make fish bite. Uh, we have to do the best we can to be as upfront, honest, and transparent as we can. And then from there, if it's safe and doable, we'll, we'll go out. Uh, the problem with that 12-hour extreme trip is the safe and doable line for like a 39-hour trip is pretty high. It can be 6 foot. It could be 20, 25 mile an hour, and we can go out on a 39-hour trip. If it's 3 and a half foot, we got to cancel a 12-hour extreme trip. That's the problem with the 12-hour extreme trip is it's – extremely weather sensitive and it does get canceled often especially in the cooler months where we have a lot of these cold fronts we have a lot of this bad weather the summer is very less common <laughs> to be canceled but it does get canceled too because we have tropical systems that move through there is no way to guarantee that you can book a trip that won't get canceled there's always a chance any trip could get canceled for a litany of reasons. We work really hard to prevent that. We try to do our best to prevent that. But I would not be truthful, honest, or even remotely feel good about saying that, yes, you can book a trip with 100% confidence that it will, won't get canceled. Because I can't say that. It's in our industry, we can't say that, unfortunately. It's like airlines, right? How often does an, uh, your airplane get canceled, your flights? Not that often. They, they fly in some crazy weather, uh, and they'll fly with a pretty empty plane. Uh, but if the weather's bad enough, they got to cancel. It's kind of the same situation, except for the 12-hour extreme is, unfortunately, the bar for weather sensitivity is extremely low. So, unfortunately, we do have to cancel more than we would like. All right. 
With that, let's give away one more set of trips. We've got our five-hour half-day trip for two lucky or one lucky winner, two guests, uh, and then we'll answer one more question, and then we'll get to our thirty-nine-hour trip giveaway and close out the show. So let's see who won our five-hour half-day for two guests. Lucky winner is Mick Dodge from Apollo Beach. Congratulations, Mick Dodge. You've got five minutes or less to text us your full home address to claim that free fishing trip. So make sure you text us within five minutes to prove you're watching live. All right. So why is that for certain fish, a keeper length are shorter than others, like hogfish and red grouper? Um, so keeper lengths are set based on uh, fecundity and age length, maturity and age growth and composition data tables. So it's a complicated algorithm to pretty much ensure that at that keeper size, a certain, propo certain proponent uh, or a certain population has a chance to repopulate the species based on spawning potential ratios or SPRs. So things like red snapper, that's a, that's a really complicated answer. <laughs> to simplify it, to answer it quickly, basically the, the, the minimum size limits are different for different species because different species reproduce at different rates, they become sexually mature at different rates, and they become sexually mature at different sizes. So basically for things like snook, uh, it has a, um, a uh, slot because they want to make sure uh, those overslot fish that are really, really fecund, they can produce a lot of eggs, they want to make sure those bigger fish spawning females are protected. And the smaller males they want to make sure are protected so they can populate the eggs and fertilize the eggs. And in that small slot... They allow those fish to be harvested only small times of the year because that's the size fish that is most abundant and has had the chance to spawn at least one time. So that's how they set it for snook. Red snapper, for example, they want to make sure they've spawned twice. The spawning potential ratio is much smaller. We fish that species a lot harder. Things that are uh, homogeneous, I forget the term, but homogenous i don't know uh, i don't know the term but the things like red grouper gag grouper hogfish that change sexes it's even more complicated so there's a lot of different variables that go into it but basically life history of the fish uh, it's biology and then it's male to female ratio and then age and growth composition so like at what length is it what age and then sexual maturity and fecundity are all different variables that basically make up how they set minimum size limits for different species. So not an easy question to answer. <laughs> and it's different for every fish. That, that question would be answered differently for every single species that we talk about, really. So good question, but complicated answer. Uh, best thing to do is to check out our fishery science and management page. Have you seen it yet? If you haven't seen it yet, go to our website page, hit fishing trips, scroll down to uh, more info, and hit fishery science and management. This page has a litany of different videos and little things about how fishery science and management works, plus at the bottom, a ton of helpful links. Uh, you can sign up for emails. Oh, I clicked on something. Uh, you can sign up for emails. You can sign up for newsletters. You can... Uh, read a bunch of information and learn about more uh, of how the science and management fisheries management and science works so highly recommend that website page if you haven't checked it out yet definitely make sure you check it out because there's a lot of stuff to learn there and there's a lot of ways to get involved at the bottom of the page uh well that's a good question that we want to answer real quick uh, will shrimp bait available be a problem as it warms up? Yes. Every year, shrimp become a problem uh, as it warms up. As the water warms, the bait shrimp, they swim out of the bays and swim into the gulf and they spread out. So it becomes harder for bait shrimp fishermen to catch the shrimp. So this time of year, they start to get a little smaller on us. Starts around March, April. Around St. Patty's Day, we start to notice the shrimp can get a little smaller. We still see some big ones, but 
on average, the average size bait shrimp starts to decrease. And as we get into like later May, June, the water starts to warm up. We start to get less and less shrimp delivered. And then sometimes in the heat of the summer, we get no shrimp. And around July 4th every year, they get really small, really hard to find. And uh, that lasts all the way through until like September. And then we get our first cold front around October. We start to see the big shrimp and lots of them come back just in time for the hogfish to pick back up. Interesting how those two things kind of come together. Kind of interesting, right? So uh, generally, that's how the, the, the system works. We start to see a decrease in the number of shrimp. They get a little smaller until July 4th. Then it really hits rock bottom. They're super small. We don't get a lot of them. And then it starts to pick up back up as the water temperatures cool off. Always a problem. Shrimp every year in the summertime get tough to find a lot of them. All right. Don't forget, final Friday this week, 6 to 9 p.m., free crawfish, free beer, free soda, free water, and Chick-fil-A will be there selling chick sa chicken sandwiches. We've got a DJ. We've got a ton of vendor booths. We've got some cornhole. We've got live music. There's concerts. There's pub crawls. It's a good time. Come out and join us for final Friday. This Friday, 6 to 9 p.m., best weather tomorrow afternoon looking real nice for that five-hour half day this weekend's 12-hour night snapper looking good the weekend fishing trips if you're an advanced angler and not scared tuesday's 39 hour is gonna go but it is gonna be a rough one so hopefully we'll see you out on the water let's find out who won a 39 hour trip for one lucky winner that lucky winner is Wesley Foster from Northeast Florida. Congratulations. You got five minutes or less to claim that free trip. Text us your full home address to the phone number on the screen. The rest of you guys will see you for the Supporters After Show at 845. Supporters After Show will kick off at 845 p.m. We'll see you there in our supporters group. And then we'll see everyone else next week, every Sunday night. Oh, excuse me. Not next week. It's Easter. So a week from today is Easter Sunday. We will not have a live show on Easter Sunday. Hubbard's Marina is closed on Easter Sunday. So Hubbard's Marina is closed. No live show. We're taking a week off. We'll see you the week after Easter every Sunday night, 7.30 p.m. So almost every Sunday night, 7.30 p.m. We'll see you in two weeks. Y'all have a great, sh great night. Thanks for joining our show, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. We're out.